Great. Welcome, everybody, to the Quark Research Talks. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, kickstart this new year of research talks uh, across the, um, the board in terms of uh, CO2 research, uh, from experiments to modeling to computation and anything related to um, helping us uh, fight climate change and uh, find viable and practical solutions for uh, removing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and uh, utilizing and storing CO2 uh, into other forms that can guarantee long-term storage of carbon. Uh, so this is the CO2 research talks. If you remember, uh, if you join us from last year, uh, we used to have this format of having two online lectures followed by Q&A, but today we start a new sort of format that is more flexibility. And we have uh, one um, uh, esteemed colleague joining us for uh, the full uh, hour. And I will get to the introduction of uh, the, uh, our colleague Massimo Taboni later on in this, uh, um, in this presentation. But first of all, I wanted to give you, uh, again, an introduction about the center. This is a mission-oriented and interdisciplinary center that is centered on CO2 capture and conversion for storage and use at scale. So the emphasis is on the scale of the problem. <clears throat> we are aware of the fact, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that the problem of uh, greenhouse gas in, in the atmosphere is uh, requires a very large scale and we have to approach it uh, at, that, uh, at that level. Uh, this is a research center that is sponsored by the Novo Nordisk Foundation that includes uh, collaborative approaches between uh, chemistry and life sciences. And it's continuously expanding in its uh, uh, seven plus years of operation that we're planning to, to have. It brings together technical fields such as in capturing and converting CO2 for non-geological and non-liquid CO2 storage and ut utilization. And as I mentioned, it brings together multiple different disciplines, including systems levels, modeling and simulations, as well as experiments and uh, computation uh, that are related to scalable CO2 and carbon technologies um, that are uh, related to reducing CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, as well as uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, we have also efforts in uh, outreach and educational programs, and there's events throughout the years uh, in Denmark and outside Denmark that the center participates in, in order to extend the reach of our center beyond the, the scientific community. It was uh, started officially and founded in uh, January of 2022 with a seven-year grant that can be extended after review. It's a mission-driven center with this uh, hub and satellite structure. The main, um, the headquarters are at Horace University in Denmark. And there's two other institutions in Denmark that participate, the University of Copenhagen and the Technical University of Denmark, as well as two international um, external centers in the satellite structures, the University of Tübingen in Germany and Stanford University in the US. Um, the hub is located at Aarhus University, and there have been already uh, grants that have been awarded to other institutions as well beyond this hub and satellite structure that we'll be get to know uh, more in the next um, few uh, uh, episodes of our court research talks. So today we welcome uh, our esteemed colleague Massimo Tavoni. Uh, it's a really a pleasure, Massimo, to have you here today and talking to you about your um, current research work. Uh, just so you know, um, Massimo is a full professor at the School of Management of uh, the Polytechnical in Milano, uh, one of the top schools in uh, Italy and Europe. He's also the director of the European uh, Institute on Economics and the Environment. He has uh, served on many different um, uh, panels throughout the years, but one relevant thing that I want to point out is that he was one of the lead authors of the fifth and sixth assessment reports for the IPCC, uh, the organism related to reporting about climate change uh, at the international panel discussions. 
Um, so it clearly has a variety of other uh, awards and recognitions, but I don't want to uh, take any more time from, from the introduction. I want Massimo to uh, give his uh, talk. Um, and so I would encourage you to share your screen and uh, uh, start your talk. Thank you, Massimo, for being here today. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Matteo, for um, for having me and for the organization for inviting me to your lecture series. I hope you can see my screen now. It should be working. Yes, it's perfect. Great. And so, thanks for your kind words, Matteo. It's really a pleasure to be here today. I, I looked into the previous presentations, um, and I thought. These were very interesting and very technical, of course, because many of you, I believe, are working on very hard problems. And today I'm going to take a little bit of a different view that is mostly related to my research uh, and takes a bird's eye view on uh, especially CO2 removal, but I can say CO2 capture more generally, by focusing and trying to highlight a little bit the equity and economic implication of such technology and such strategies. And obviously, carbon management is very important. We just we need that to, to, to we're gonna need it eventually, obviously, to decarbonize our tobacco sectors. Uh, we are in them today, and any way to remediate to the too high concentration of CO2 that have accumulated in the atmosphere. So that's pretty obvious that these need it. But the question, and, the, and of course, you are working on trying to solve this through experiments uh, and computer experiments or actually physical experiments, as Matteo was saying. Uh, and today I, I take a bit broader view and, and think, you know, more broadly, you know, what and how much we need of especially CO2 removal. I'm going to be focused mostly on CO2 removal, but you can think it or equate it, although it's not perfect, uh, to CO2 removal with storage. Uh, and also what are, you know, the more, the, the more uh, and to what extent is this just a technological issue or just it's a broader issue? And obviously from the title, you probably already understand that I'm trying. To, I'm going to try to persuade you that there are important equity and economic uh, issues around CO2 uh, storage technologies that we should be considered uh, when thinking about this as a solution. And it's going to be inspired by the work that my myself and, and colleagues have been doing also in IPCC. I, I myself am originally an engineer, so I've been working a lot on modeling simulations and model experiments. I still do that today but also trying to add some of the economics and the social aspects because those I think are pretty important. So let me start from essentially a little bit of, uh, of my research. Is, this is just one of the charts from the APCC. You might have seen things like this. These are a bunch of scenarios looking forward over the century and projected temperature and global warming. Uh, um, we, we know already we are well, well above 1.5 degree, above pre-industrial level, and we are heading towards 1.5 degree. This decade, or anytime soon, could also be this year at some point. And, uh, and we're exploring different futures related to different warming. Uh, you see different warming here to the, to, the, to the left and to the right. And so we use model simulation and scenarios. Let me see if I can also use a pointer. Maybe you can see my live mother pointer too. OK, that helps. Uh, so you can see different temperature objectives, and we're gonna run you know, a, a great bunch of scenarios using models to try to explore. You know the high end scenarios we want to avoid, the four, three, four, five degrees of warming, and the low end scenarios uh, consistent with the Paris Agreement that we would like to achieve, and we are trying to do our best to achieve. Now, how is is this done? Well. This is done by researchers like myself, but actually a large community. And sometimes you have these kind of moments of excitement where you think, well, maybe my research has been useful to some degree. This was a sentence from Bloomberg uh, um, News uh, saying, you know, the world is moving towards net zero because of a single sentence. And indeed, net zero is, is everywhere uh, now. Um, you can find it almost, uh, really, almost, literally almost everywhere. And and the question is, is where is net zero? Well, and of course, net zero is actually a pretty complicated term. It depends what, what zero you're thinking of, whether it's CO2 or greenhouse gases uh, uh, and other things. Uh, but it is certainly has become, uh, quite recently, the kind of focal point for policy, for companies, for governments, uh, for, for nations, uh, for cities, uh, and so forth. And where is this coming from? Well, it, what Bloomberg was saying is that this is a single sentence coming from IPCC, and this is the sentence that they were quoting in that article, 
This comes from a report from APCC, which is called 1.5 special reports, because APCC has some special reports. And then in that report, there was a high level statement in the summary for policymaker, the C1, you can see here. And I'm going to mostly read it, where it says potentially in this model pathway uh, with no limited overshoot of 1.5 degree, and we are already getting into climate related issues. Uh, um, emissions have to essentially decrease by this amount by 2030. There's also some range to provide uncertainty and also reaching net zero around 2050. Uh, that is really being a kind of a high level message to get to be compatible with the Paris Agreement um, of 1.5 degree or, or stay below two degrees with, uh, uh, with the intention to, to, to be as close as possible to 1.5. So possibly overshooting 1.5 or exceeding 1.5 degree for a certain amount of years, and uh, hopefully returning to it after this temporal exceedance, when more or less what these scenarios and these models tell you is that you have to be around 2050 neutral. Now, the models also do not all say the same thing, but you see the range actually, and this is only the interquantile range, not the full range of scenarios. So it's actually pretty narrow around the date. Uh, so it's a strong consensus among models. Uh, that connects very long and ambitious temperature targets, such as the one embedded in the Paris Agreement, uh, to things like people now understand, I am sure you in your field understand as well, very well, and it's motivating a lot of your research, which is the net zero work. Now, net zero, of course, means that several things, but one of the high level messages that we also find that you will find in the latest, actually, this is the sixth assessment report of the APCC, is that in a way to do what we just said, we would be need to do um, CO2 removal and CO2 capture and removal is inevitable for Paris compliance scenarios. Huh? It's inevitable and it takes two fundamental different forms. The one is of course uh, of uh, uh, CO2 uh, removals to manage the, those emissions, those gross emissions which we expect, this is an illustrative chart, by the way, the APCC, it doesn't, these are not real numbers, but it's just to illustrate the point, we might have residual emissions in the system and those need to be compensated by CO2 removals, or if you manage to find ways uh, also to produce products that can do that, that would also be great and that demand might be reduced. Or in any case, you might need the removals to create some of the products uh, and, and the fuels that uh, are carbon free. So in both cases, you need uh, removers to compensate and offset a certain amount of emissions that would be hard to abate anyhow. And plus, if you want to go net negative, uh, because we have overshoot or overshot exceeded temperature targets, which we are very likely, almost certain to do, then the CO2 removers will be even more, uh, because we might then, obviously, by design, then we need it to get to the negative CO2 emissions. Uh, even if we are fully at zero with gross emissions, uh, obviously you would need CDR and CO2 removers to, um, to net out and remediate the extra carbon which has been emitted in the atmosphere and we need to absorb back. Now, this is all very clear, but of course it's also a very debated topic. And what does, what, what kind of, so this is just an illustrative chart. And then now let's look at a little bit the real numbers or numbers produced by these models that I just alluded to before. And uh, the question is, you, if you look at, uh, at the future, in a no-climate policy world, you don't need all of these technologies, capture and storage and removals. But as soon as you move to targets such as the 1.5 target of the Paris Agreement, well, depending on the target, well, these, these removals become needed. And they become needed and become very sizable. And this is probably one of the things that most of you use in your motivating slides, right? The IPCC says, you need five, 10 gigaton uh, of uh, removals or neg ne negative emissions uh, uh, by, this, uh, by these dates, right? And these scales are extremely large. And maybe there are also some indication of what kind of technology we're gonna be using. It's mostly driven, as you see, by the policy. If there's very limited policy or no policy at all, we don't need it. it, it depending on how ambitious, how fast the policy is, to what extent you're strengthening uh, sectoral activities and ambitious actions. Maybe you're coming up with better carbon management technologies. Then those reductions, those needs of CO2 removals might be lower. Uh, but in all cases, and that's what the APCC is very clear about, 
achieving the Paris Agreement uh, cannot be done without thinking about technologies that can capture and store and remove CO2. Given the accumulation of CO2 that we already have, the committed emission from the existing infrastructure and the difficulty of abating uh, or getting to net zero across all sectors. So it is mostly driven by policy, and it is, of course, depends on what kind of technology you put in. Uh, a lot of these scenarios have a lot of bioenergy plus CCS uh, in the past. This was, which you can see also in this chart here, it's just an example of much you would need in a specific scenario in terms of CCF, biology plastic yet, with a lot of rate of criticism about you know, to what extent is this compatible with environmental sustainability in terms of land use pattern. Uh, there's land use change, and then there are, of course, many other ways of thinking about CO2 removal. Obviously, a lot of attention now going also to capturing CO2 directly from the air. Uh, either for CO2 removal or for creating new products. And some of you might be might, might be working on things like this. You could also go through oceans uh, capturing techniques remotely, remotely. We've been focusing on the atmosphere so far. So there are many, many CDR options and CO2 removals and CCS and storage options. Uh, obviously, in these models, especially BAC and bio and, uh, and also forest, which do not require CCS, of course, forest afforestation have been prominently shown in these scenarios, but there are regional variations. Uh, and then, of course, you need, you're going to probably need a lot of these to minimize environmental risk. And that might also be a motivating claim in your research, that this is inevitable, it's needed a large scale, and from a variety of sources uh, to, uh, to manage such a large transition. And this is probably is very well true, but of course, we have to ask ourselves, where is this coming from and what are the underlying implications? And so the point here I'm trying to make is just a technology choice. For us, I mean, for you, I've been heavily working both in, in, in thinking about new technologies and the disruptive technologies, you might think that is obviously the key. But what I'm pointing, trying to point out, point out today is that that's certainly important. Uh, but it is also a matter of equity and economics also. And I try to combine both things. You might think the two things are not together, but you can think about economic equities in terms of affordability and justness in, in terms of uh, just effort and division of effort between uh, different parties, countries, companies, and so far. And I think there are three main points for this uh, argument. And, and then, then I try to argue on both three grounds. Uh, Try to keep it short, also to keep some time for questions, if you have. The first point is about intergenerational equity. And by this, what we mean, we mean the intergenerational, we mean there are many, obviously climate, you know, CO2 is, is forever, stays in the atmosphere, essentially, for hundreds of years. Obviously, this is the very, is at its core essence, an intergenerational problem. Generations which are young now, or have not yet been born, or uh, will be affected by climate change as well, uh, and even more than our own generations. So the question of, of, of which generations uh, are going to be affected the most is very obviously very relevant, and we probably obviously have seen, made very prominent also by the debate uh, by Fridays for the Future and other social movements. And I'm going to try to persuade you that these technologies are related to equity. You might already have been persuaded already. If that's the case, that's and that's great. If not, that might come as a, a bit of a surprise. The other thing is distributive equity. What do we mean by distributional equity or distributive equity? Is who is winning, who is losing uh, from having disruptive carbon management, uh, storage, and CO2 removal technologies? There will be leader, winner, loser in terms of companies, obviously, in terms of countries, and uh, not just generations, but uh, within a generation, within a society, um, who are going to be the most um, positively affected and negatively affected? And how can we balance two things? We want, after all, the climate transition to be also a fair one. Uh, and then there's a final point, which is a risk and precaution. Uh, of course, technology is uncertain. You are all trying new technologies. Uh, some will succeed, some will not succeed. That's part of technological progress. Um, and the question of, uh, of how we manage this risk associated with these technologies and to what extent should we embrace precautionary principles is an often used argument for thinking carefully about uh, the role of uh, CO2 removal and let's say, let's say 
more generic carbon storage and removal technologies. So let me go through these three points and then essentially I'll finish there. And so point number one, uh, the, this, the intergenerational equity uh, point. So, okay, I'm moving things around here. Uh, okay, intergenerational. Now, there are many ways uh, to achieve the Paris Agreement targets. Even in the scenarios that I showed you before, um, in this paper, we, 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 we try to look at two different possible ways to become, which are both compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, one is a, a, a way which you can look by these kind of scenarios in, in the blue, where you have very rapid action, and then you have essentially a net zero carbon economy. There are still some residual emission left because this is CO2 equivalent, so it includes also other greenhouse gases, which by the way, do not need to go to zero. We actually don't need all emissions to go to zero, all greenhouse gas emissions to go to zero to stabilize temperature, and we need carbon to go to zero. Uh, that's one of the high level message of all the latest IPCC. Um, and then we have another way, which is the red one. It essentially takes things more easily uh, in the first part. Uh, but then, of course, you have to make up for the things that you have not done before. And this requires uh, larger efforts and actually net negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, in the second half of the century. And you see, these are both inter these interpretations are both compatible with the Paris Agreement, uh, but obviously they do have very different consequences for technology, but obviously, obviously also for international equity. Um, and there's a clear trade-off. Uh, the red ones, which are the ones where essentially there's more delay and more CO2 capture, of course, rely much more on the negative emissions, as you can already see. Uh, from uh, from this chart. The blue one, on the other hand, require very fast uh, immediate emission reductions, which would mean also a significant effort from all countries, uh, including also developing countries, which raises issues about political feasibility um, and governance of such a rapid transition. There will be also differences in terms of impacts of climate change. Obviously, the two scenarios are not equivalent. Uh, they might be equivalent in at the end of the century, they both reach the same temperature. I can assure you that. But in the transient time, there will be different climate outcomes coming from these two different worlds. And of course, those also have consequences. So essentially, also here, what you see, depending on these uh, pathways that we decide to en enroll, is that in one case, uh, I'm going to have more effort in the, in, the, in, the, in the short term, but then I'm going to have uh, benefits in the long term. And this is economic implication of those two scenarios. So higher cost, obviously you have to do more now, so it might cost you a bit more at the beginning, but then in the end, your economy is actually going to benefit because you have done most of the work earlier on. And, and the trade-off, the, the other trade-off is actually if you actually delay your action today, then you, know, you might save some money at the beginning, but then if you delay too much, obviously, then you find yourself in trouble because you cannot reach those targets uh, as easily as it would have been had you started before. So you see these temporal trade-offs. This is time over this axis, and you see always this kind of plus and minuses depending on the time of the horizon where you, where you see. And this is an intergenerational tension, obviously, and the point here, what is, is this driven by? And, you know, in 1920s, this is, there was a famous philosopher and mathematician, Frank Ramsey, that you see depicted here. He was incredibly smart. Uh, he came up with very advanced maths. Unfortunately, he died at age 26, so he couldn't do too much in his, in his research career. But he, at the time, he, among other things, he just wrote a paper in mathematical economics, just a side note. It was kind of a distraction for weekends, I think, from his deep math thinking. And he came up, uh, his, his name is Frank Ramsey, and he came up with an equation which is still used today uh, in economics and mathematical economics to describe how we think about the future in economic terms. This is the so-called discount factor. So how much we value the future, how much we value future money compared to today. We obviously, each of us has a tendency to be relatively impatient typically. So if I give you something today or the equivalent amount in a year time, obviously you would be more pleased to have to receive it today than in a year time, or equivalently, if you'd like to be compensated by receiving more today than in a year time. Uh, 
But when it comes to, to these big decisions such as climate change, should we impatience be accounted for in our decision? Is it equitable and ethical at all to discount the future because we are impatient? Frank Ramsey already, when he wrote it in the 20s of the last century, 100 years ago, he said that it is immoral to discount future generation, implicitly assuming this parameter to be essentially zero. And then there's a second part, which depends on to what extent we value the economy uh, and to what extent the economy will evolve over time. But I won't go too much in the details. Now, you might think this yeah, 100 years old stuff, who cares? Turns out it's actually very relevant. Uh, um, Richard, that, this is a very recent article in New York Times uh, um, uh, about a per someone, an academic named Richard Reves, who has been working in the government uh, and changing the way the government, in the US government, uh, and generally the US government calculates the cost and benefits on the regulations. And among the things that, that he came up with, again, in a very deep uh, report, was essentially recommendations around how to think about discount. And uh, we've done some research on, on this and apply these discounting ideas to the issues of CO2 removal. And what we found in the, in the kind of research, this is the reference for the paper, is that the more we discount the future, so the percentage increase in discount rate, uh, in temporal discount rate, increasing the budget overshoot uh, and the amount of negative emissions and storage of CO2 removals by 7%. Um, and if we use what is typically used by industry, um, even now, industry is used even more than 5%, but often sometimes by governments, uh, then these policy costs are more, four times higher for future generation than they are today. So our recommendation was, you know, in the spirit uh, of, uh, of Ramsey, to actually use a very low discount rate, 2%, which essentially this would be 2%, and then this essentially would, would be zero. And that if we do that, then the distribution of effort between current generation and future generation would be equal. Now, this is a parameter which is often in the models. You don't see it. It's a line of code somewhere, maybe, implicitly or explicitly. Um, but this, this highlights that the choice of this parameterization, which is a normative choice, after all, an ethical and equity-related choice, uh, matters essentially quite significantly for the amount of carbon sequestration we will need and for the distribution of effort between generations. So even in our research, and we use mathematical models, uh, philosophy comes back in through these choices. And in the governments, we have a very important role in deciding you know, how to wear, what to do on uh, climate policy regulation and more general pollution fight, because they also include air pollution. This applies, these considerations apply equally. Now, this is point one or inter, on intergenerational uh, uh, distribution. Uh, now, let me come to the second point, which is distributed generation. And obviously, a lot of this will depend on who owns and will own the technology. There's a big technology race right now in the world, very well innovative technologies that are compatible with climate goals. And uh, a lot of this distributive effort is really who owns and will own technology. And there's a lot of concerns about the incumbents that they might lose market shares. And there's a lot of excitement by newcomers of seeing and seeking new opportunities. The question is, of course, to what extent the private and public will play a role. And I will obviously assume that most of these technologies uh, they've been developed in the past will come from the private sector. But for some specific technologies and CO2 removal, is a good example as a remediation technology. Uh, well, we should also consider to what extent the public uh, and government uh, led technologies and companies could have a role, because it's a very peculiar way of remediating to it, especially when it comes just to CO2 absorption, to rem remediating to past damage more than providing a service directly. Of course, there are fossil fuel incumbents whose role is very important uh, and who are struggling now to, to keep their own positions and seek new opportunities in these evolving uh, dynamics and markets. And of course, a lot will depend on the infrastructure, uh, especially when it comes to thinking about you know, new fossil fuels or new carbon fossil fuels, uh, but also when it comes to thinking about CO2 storage, uh, you need infrastructure to capture it and also to transport it to locations where you want to store it, if you want to store it. If you want to repro uh, reprocess it into products, those products will have to be transported anyhow. 
And so the issues of, of infrastructure is often, of course, built by the government is going to be determining essentially uh, the distributive elements. Another point is how will the investment be remunerated? Now, these technologies are very early stage. They are not competitive. They're not mature enough. They need kind of incentives. And there are many ways that we can provide incentives for new technologies. And once they come into the market and they are mature, there are many ways where you can remunerate them. Uh, there are public finances. Uh, of course, there are carbon markets. Europe has the largest carbon market in the world. Uh, the US is taking a different route uh, through uh, essentially subsidy schemes uh, to new technology through the IRA. Uh, and public finances, of course, has also a, a, a cost, a public cost. Uh, there are issues related to carbon debt and mechanisms uh, for managing also intergenerational equity issues uh, to what extent companies should be led liable for the carbon debt they had accumulated uh, and to what extent the promise to develop carbon remediation and carbon management technology should be uh, connected to these, to these issues. And of course, all this comes at what cost for society. Uh, and these issues are still very much open, especially when it comes to uh, market instruments and policy instruments for this for carbon remediation, carbon, carbon storage, and carbon removal technologies. Uh, we still don't know. I mean, Europe has a European emission trading scheme. To what extent should negative emission technologies be including in existing uh, uh, carbon markets? Should what extent new policy instruments should be thought of and devised will matter a lot. And as, as an example, we have a paper which is forthcoming uh, where we looked at the financing of negative emissions, specifically direct uh, air capture. Um, and the question is, to what extent can we use public budget and re or revenues from, uh, uh, let's say, carbon markets or carbon taxes to finance uh, technologies uh, to uh, capture and absorb CO2 from, uh, uh, from yeah, here we go. Uh, from the um, from the air, and and the question is uh, in this paper, what we did is is quantify to what extent the risk of policy regressivity. What do we mean by policy regressivity? We mean that the more carbon removed, uh, uh, carbon removal we're going to be doing, uh, the more there's a risk, uh, depending on the policy instruments we're going to use, that this will generate. In outcomes which are not equal in terms of inequality, economic inequality, meaning that we profit, let's say, the rich more uh, predominantly. And typically, it depends on the regions. It's pretty complicated simulation work where we did others of actually numerical simulations. Uh, it depends on the ownership schemes of these technologies, who owns uh, the electric capture technologies, where is, this is going to be done. To what extent the technology will be remunerated by carbon markets or not? But there are, and when these technologies will be mature, sufficiently mature in the few decades, maybe in a couple of decades from now, now, now there is a, a, a significant risk that we highlight in this paper of uh, windfall profits uh, for, for companies who own uh, um, crucial technologies to capture CO2 from the air. And if not man well managed, those uh, willful profit can exacerbate economic inequality uh, uh, beyond what, what we would be reasonable to consider. So there is a part of, of what we call policy regressivity. Finally, there's also risks and uh, uh, precautionary approach. This was the last point of the three points I tried to make. Uh, we looked at two pathways before this end of century pathway and net zero pathway. The blue one being you know, more rapid now and the red one being slightly slower uh, now. I, they achieved the same Paris Agreement compliant target. This is a paper published in Nature Climate uh, a couple of years ago by colleagues. Uh, um, but they do have different transient climates. Um, this is just an example of the disproportionate distribution of heat wave durations between these two um, scenarios, uh, depending on whether also you're likely, depending on the target, on the climate target you are you're targeting of. And, and, and what you see here, and also there's also on this on this right the heat wave duration uh, uh, in terms of uh, I don't remember exactly what is whether it's days in a year or percentage number of days in a year. But independently, you see across these, these two pictures that depending on the way we embark on this 
emission reduction strategies if we rely more on CO2 removal and carbon storage, which is uh, the red one, um, the uh, duration of heat waves, uh, um, especially for uh, this kind of, these are the 95 percentile, so in the tails, especially in the tails of the distributions, uh, will be different. Now, we know the tails are important because of extreme events. In climate change, droughts are related to climate, um, to, to tails uh, in uh, heat wave durations. Uh, and so the way different ways we, we, we manage climate overshoot through technologies also affect uh, climate risks uh, differently, which, by the way, also will be felt by different generations in different ways, as we already alluded to before. So climate risk is something we should consider when we think about technology, because by changing emissions, we change the climate, and by changing climate, we maintain the extreme event and the past. Of course, there are also technology risks. Uh, well, in IPCC, we, we, we show that, you know, you need CO2 storage to, 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 to stay within the, the Paris Agreement target. A lot of people also criticized us by saying, well, the technology storage, uh, some of these are highly uncertain. What if they fail? What is their technological risk associated with those? I think those are there and we have to manage appropriately by developing a portfolio of technologies that minimizing the collective risks of having technologies, technology failure on a, on a, on a large scale, uh, but recognize at the same time the, the crucial role of these technologies in uh, ensuring that we meet these very ambitious goals that are to get to, uh, let's say, net zero emissions uh, uh, by mid-century, which is indeed a very, a very ambitious goal. Lastly, there are political economy risks, uh, uh, which I didn't discuss so far so much, but obviously, <laughs> We live in a world where collective action toward reducing CO2 emissions uh, is not uh, very likely to happen. It's not happening, as a matter of fact. Uh, we see a lot of positive development in Europe, US, and other countries in this uh, green technology race, uh, but we see also a lot of geopolitical tensions by now uh, in terms of energy, material security, and so forth, and geopolitical security tensions and nationalism a bit on the rise. So to what extent uh, are technologies related to CO2 capture and storage and removal important for managing these risks? Uh, if the governance especially um, and the capacity of institutions uh, to implement uh, emission reduction strategies in the short term is limited, and it is limited uh, by, by, by obviously limited governance, especially in certain countries and jurisdictions, and also by the geopolitical tensions that we just described, then technologies such as CO2 storage and, and removal will play an even larger role uh, because they will have to be used on a larger scale to make up for the delays uh, uh, that, uh, that, that in actual em uh, emission reduction. Obviously, they will not substitute emission reduction, but they will have to be used on a larger scale. All these climate technology and political risk in, in, in kind of interface one with each other, uh, and should be considered uh, properly when thinking about the technological development. So let me come to the main conclusion. So I do not take too much time away and, and uh, we also have some time for discussion if you have questions. I think the starting point of, I'm sure many of the presentations that we have seen is the true starting point. That is CCS and TDR, they play a really prominent role in pathways, scenarios, consistent with the low carbon world. And that's inevitable. If you want to stay you know, within a decent amount of warming, especially even more so, if as it's gonna happen very soon this decade, we're gonna be overshooting uh, 1.5 degree of temperature and heading towards two. And so we have to remediate this. The only way possible way is to, 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 um, to, 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 to develop technologies related to carbon management uh, and carbon removal. However, the point that I try to make today, which is a broad point, and, um, is that eth ethics and economics matters. So these scenarios that you see coming from IPCC, they might, you might think they are mostly driven by assumptions about technology, and they are to a large degree, for sure, uh, or assumptions about environmental and climate sustainability. But it turns out, as I try to, to show you, that you know, parameters in models, uh, assumptions, uh, that relates to how these uh, technologies are represented in terms of economics and ethics matters too, and matters for regulation uh, in uh, climate policy 
in national and international legislations. And I think I'm trying to make three main equity arguments for a critical reflection about uh, CCS and CDR. It has to be critical in the sense that it remains a clearly crucial element in all these transition scenarios, uh, uh, as we just described, and that's why it's also in red, this sentence, because it is a datum. Uh, but there are three arguments that may, should make us think uh, uh, about what extent and to, uh, to where, what time, through which technologies, and at which scale we can develop uh, carbon management and removal. And the three points I made is that uh, they bring about intergenerational justice with no justice, justice concerns. They bring about distributional justice concerns in terms of wins and loses between time and also at a given time between different uh, parties. And there's an element of precaution related to technology risks that should be accounted for. And last point is also CDR governance and policies are crucial. A lot of these issues can be dealt with appropriate policies and appropriate governance of CO2 uh, removal in terms of I mean, who is going to pay, what kind of incentives, how much is technology will be remunerated now. And as they mature, uh, to what extent these subsidies or technology or incentives uh, should be rescaled uh, appropriately, to what extent we should consider together carbon management and CO2 storage alongside mitigation options such as you know, renewables, uh, energy efficiency, and others. All these are open questions for policies right now. Europe is thinking very deeply about these issues now as we are entering the, the next decade towards uh, very ambitious climate objectives. Uh, and I think it should be remaining uh, a very important point of research. So I thought, I'll stop here, Matteo, and... Uh, uh, I'm happy to take any questions yeah, if you have, and I hope this was clear. Yeah.